Even Hamilton's paperwork looks acceptable to me, and I believe he'll do fine. But this other kid... Big Mike. Michael Orr gives us no reason to believe that, based on his records, that he would be successful here. Well, how bad could it be? We're not exactly sure how old he is due to his lack of records. He has a measured IQ of 80, which is 6th percentile. His grade point average begins with zero. 0. 0.6. Everyone passed him along. They gave him D's so they could hand their problem off to the next school. It's a brave kid. For wanting to come here. For wanting a quality education. An education denied him by the poor quality of schools he's attended. I tell you, most kids with his background wouldn't come within 200 miles of this place. Coach Cotton, we understand your interest in this young man's athletic abilities. Well, he wouldn't be able to play sports until he got his grades up anyway. Forget sports. Look at the wall. Christian, we either take that seriously or we paint over it. You don't admit Michael Orr because of sports. You admit him because it's the right thing to do. That clip was uh, from the movie The, the Blind Side, and, and uh, Big Mike was a, was a homeless teen who grew up on the, on the streets of, of Memphis, and uh, you know, he, he grew up in uh, low-income housing projects, and you know, his mother was a crackhead. You know, Big Mike had done nothing to deserve the, the setting that, that he grew up in. He, he had done nothing that... Uh, that caused him to deserve that, that lot in life. Consequently, you know, as uh, there was this Christian school on the other side of town that was, was considering whether, whether Big Mike could come there and, and attend as a student or not, there was also nothing that he had in his life that caused him to deserve a spot in that school. You know, his IQ was low. His GPA was 0 0.6. He was passed from grade to grade with D's because people really didn't want to invest in him. They just wanted to, to pass him along in the system for, for someone else to, to take care of. But Wingate Christian School admitted him not because Big Mike deserved it, but they admitted him to their school because they were extending grace to him. You know, this morning we're we're starting a series that we're going to be talking about grace for, for the next several weeks. And as I begin to, to think about the topic of grace, I want to make a, a little bit of a distinction between grace and mercy. Now, in the case of both grace and, and mercy, someone is, is getting a, a benefit, something positive is, is happening to them, but there's, there's a difference between grace and, and mercy. In the case of mercy, let's say that someone is, is going to, uh, to stand before a, a judge in a court of law because they have committed a crime and they've been found guilty. You know, mercy would be not receiving the punishment or penalty that they deserve. You know, maybe they've been found guilty and, and there are guidelines for, uh, for what the maximum sentence could be or, or what the maximum fine could be, but but as they're found guilty, the, the lawyer pleads on, on their behalf and, and says that uh, you ask the judge to, to show mercy because of mitigating circumstances or, or because of, of something that, that they've done, something, some change that they've, they've made in their life. And so even though they deserve punishment, you know, even they deserve a certain fine or a certain sentence, if the judge lessens that, they say that he showed mercy upon them. Maybe in your household, you, 
uh, your, your child misses their curfew, and so you ground them for a week. And after three days, you, you decide to lift that grounding. You, you stated that they should be grounded for a week, but you lessened it to only three days. Well, you showed mercy. I remember a, a college class that um, we took a, a test, and, and 70% of the class failed the test using the standard uh, grading scale, but, but the professor decided to grade on a curve. He, he showed us mercy. He didn't give us necessarily what we deserve, but, but he helped us in, in that process. Well, your know, mercy is not getting what you do deserve, and grace is receiving favor that you do not deserve. Grace is, has been described as, as undeserved or unmerited favor. You know, Abraham Lincoln acknowledged that when we become too self-sufficient, we fail to recognize God's grace in our life. Have you ever thought about that, that, that a, a barrier to experiencing God's grace in your life is when we feel like we can do it on our own, when we feel we are self-sufficient, it, it's at that point that we fail to recognize God's grace. I did nothing to deserve to be born in, in this country. You know, as a nation, we struggle with, with uh, immigration laws and illegal Im immigration as a nation, but, but this is a place that, that people want to live. This is a place that, that people want to come. And it is by God's grace, not by anything that I've deserved, nothing because of what I've done, that I was born here, that, that I live here. I, I am blessed. I, I was raised in a loving home with hardworking parents, and, and because of that ad, advantage, I, or because of that experience, I have advantages in life. Those advantages were not of my own doing. It's nothing that I deserve, but it's grace. You know, we're going to talk about God's grace from many different perspective, perspectives in the next few weeks. You know, this morning, we're going to start by, by talking about grace as well, a, a theological term would be prevenient grace, grace that goes before. You know, sometimes uh, prevenient grace is referred to as preventive grace. You know, something happens, something comes in our, our lives that, that keeps something else, something worse from happening, or, or it's that grace that goes before helps to take us to a place that, that we're even able to, to experience God's saving grace in our life. It's not because of, of my own doing that, that I experience God's saving grace, but, it, but it's because of, of God's Spirit bestowing grace in my life that I was a, even able to have an understanding and, and be able to respond to that invitation of, of salvation. You know, next week, we're going to talk about saving grace. We're, we're going to, to talk about how God's grace in our life helps us to change, leaving some old ways behind and, and in embracing new ways. We're going to talk about grace from the perspective of means of grace. You know, how, do we, how do we experience God's grace? Now, it's not that we do something that somehow manipulates God or somehow forces God's hand, but how is it that, that we, what is it that we can do in our life that puts us in a position that we may be ex able to experience God's grace? We're going to talk about those, some, those things in, in three weeks. We're going to talk about uh, what happens if you fall from grace. What if you've been very close in, in your relationship with, with Christ at, at one point, but, but somehow you, you've drifted away, you've, you've held him at arm's length, length you've, you've kind of turned your back on, on that first love. Well, we're going to, to talk about what, what we do, how, how we can be restored. And finally, we're going to talk about how to share or extend grace to others. You know, grace is not simply something that, that we receive in our own lives, but it's also an issue that, that we are to, to share grace with others. You know, this morning I want to talk with you about a, a story that is found in the ninth chapter of 2 Samuel. And I'm going to tell you the story. Some of the verses are going to come up on the screen and 
but uh, it would encourage you to go home and, and to, to read this story the, this afternoon out of the, uh, the, second, the, the ninth chapter of 2 Samuel. But it's, it's a story of grace. It's a story of a young man named Mephibosheth. Now, if any of you are going to have children and you're searching for names for children, maybe Mephibosheth is one of those, uh, those names you, you'd, you'd like to use. Well, at the age of five, Meshib- Mephibosheth lived <laughs> in the king's palace. The reason he lived in the king's palace was his grandfather was the king. His grandfather was, was King Saul. Uh, Jonathan uh, was was his father. And King Saul w- was being attacked. He was being driven out of the, his palace, being driven out of the city. And so they were fleeing from, from the palace. And the, the nurse, the, the one who was caring for Mephibosheth, picked him up, put her on his shoulders. Undoubtedly, she had her arms full of, of many things as they were trying to, to flee for their lives from, from the palace. And it says that she dropped him. And I'm assuming that as she dropped him, she may have dropped some other things as well that, that fell on him and, and, uh, and crushed his, his ankles and, and his feet. And it, it says from the age of five, Mephibosheth was, was crippled in both feet. The story also tells us that a man by the name of, of Makar uh, had pity on him. So he took Mephibosheth into his household and raised him. And as, an, as a crippled child, Mephibosheth experienced grace. He had doth, done nothing to, to deserve Makar's kindness. And in that day, a, a crippled child would often have been left by the side of the road to die, or, or all that they could have expected out of life was, was, was to, be, to survive by, by being a beggar. Well, Mephibosheth's father... Jonathan, had been best friends with David, who is now the king. And David had promised Jonathan that he would always show kindness to his descendants. In in 1 Samuel 9, it says, David asked, is there anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? A former servant who once worked for, for Jonathan's father uh, who was king? Who was King Saul, and and told King David that that Jonathan had a had a crippled son who was still living. So David sent for Mephibosheth. Now, when you're summoned before a king, and particularly when you don't know why you're summoned before the king, it's normally not a good thing. And so Mephibosheth was going before the king, probably fearful that, that somehow the, the king was going to, to take his life. And so it says that he, as he came in, he, he bowed to, to honor the king, but it was also out of a sense of, of fear and trembling. And if the king thought that, uh, that he had done something wrong, maybe his humility would cause the, the king to somehow have some, some mercy on him. Well, in in verse 9, as Mephibosheth vowed before the king, the king said, Don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. David told Mephibosheth that he was going to to give him all the land that once belonged to, to his father and grandfather. And he also told him that the rest of your life, you are going to be able to eat at the king's table. Wow. Mephibosheth was concerned about going before the king, was concerned whether whether he would even live to tell about this day, and now all the riches of his father and grandfather are being restored to him, and the rest of his life, he he doesn't have to beg to, to survive, but the rest of his life, he is going to eat at the king's table. Can you imagine what... Relief Mephibosheth must have felt at that point. I'm saying that word too many times. Can can you imagine what relief he must have felt? He had done nothing, and yet he had hit the jackpot. He wasn't even playing the the lottery, and and he won a a rich outpouring 
of grace. He experienced God's grace. Now, we don't know a whole lot about uh, Mephibosheth's life and, and Makar's household, but we can, can assume that it wasn't always easy. Mephibosheth has gone from, from a meager existence to being very wealthy and, and being able to eat every day at, at the king's table. Now, let, let's look briefly at, at some lessons in this story about grace. And the first thing that I, that I want you to notice is that grace will find you. you know, in three weeks, we're, we're going to talk about means of grace, about positions that we can put ourselves in that we may be open and, and receptive to, to experiencing God's grace. But yet, God's grace, first of all, comes by God pursuing us. In the case of David, David was pursuing a place for him to, to demonstrate grace. David was pursuing someone to whom he could show grace. What David did was completely a gift. And Mephibosheth simply had to receive it. When we experience God's grace in our lives, he's not trying to manipulate us. No, he's providing his grace at our point of greatest need. You, know, you may remember the, the story of Joseph. Remember, Joseph's brothers sold him into to slavery. You know, Joseph's brothers, um, you know, as they sold him in, into slavery, he, he then was in, a servant in Potiphar's house. But yet, by grace, he, he raised to... Uh, a position of trusted leadership in Potiphar's house. Then he was falsely accused by, by Potiphar's wife and he was, was thrown in prison. You know, and again, by grace in prison, he was, was raised to a, a point of, of trusted leadership even as, as an inmate there in, in the prison. You know, because of God's grace through circumstances, Joseph ended up being second in command to, to Pharaoh. And you know, it was an issue that as others were saying, oh, how could these horrible things happen in, in your life, Joseph? Joseph recognized that what others intended to use to harm him, God intended for good. Even when others were seeking to, to do Joseph in, God extended grace to him. Let me tell you some exciting news today. No matter where you are, no matter what you're dealing with in your life, you are not out of the reach of God's grace. No matter where you are today, you are not out of the reach of God's grace. A second thing I want you to see about grace is that, that through grace, you find out who you, are true, you were truly born to be. Mephibosheth had been born in, in the king's palace. You know, Mephibosheth had, had, had left there at the age of five, and maybe he didn't even remember the palace. But he was destined, he was born to, to live in the palace, and now, once again, because of grace, he's able to experience who it is that he was born to be. When we experience God's grace in our life, it isn't because God feels sorry for us. When we experience God's grace in our life, that grace is actually helping to propel us, helping, us, helping to move us in the direction that God really created us to go and who it is that God created us to be. This week, this coming week, I want to encourage you to look for ways that God is extending grace in your life. I want you to look for ways that God is extending grace in your life. And as you identify that, that grace in your life, then how is that grace taking you to who it is that God created you to be? When I see God's grace at work, it gives me hope. 
It gives me a a reminder that that he has not left me alone. God has not abandoned me. I don't know about you, but there are times when I feel a bit overwhelmed with life. There are times when when the stress seems so so great, I I just think, "How how can I get out of this stress? It's easy to to get discouraged, and and in the midst of that, even it's easy to ask the question, am I really hearing God? Am I I really going in the right direction? In those times of discouragement, in those times of, of questioning, God's grace will give me hope. You know, this past week has been one of the the toughest weeks in ministry that I've probably experienced in a long time. And it's not that anything horrible happened. It was just that there were so many things leading up to today and and all the changes, more more things than I could possibly accomplish, more things than, than, than I could possibly do. And yet, in the midst of my sense of being overwhelmed, there were grace moments. Uh, there was a word of encouragement that someone spoke. Uh, there was a phone call that, uh, that came out of the blue that was unexpected, that, uh, that continues to, to bring things together that, yes, we are headed in, in the direction that God is, is leading us to go. Uh, the moment of grace was not something that, that I expected, but in the moment that I experienced God's grace, my hope was renewed. It was an issue that, that, yes, because God's grace is still at work, because I can continue to see God at work here, you know, we can continue to, to move forward. We can t- continue to, to persevere. As you experience grace moments in this coming week, may it be a reminder to you that God has not left you. May it be a reminder to you that, that God has not abandoned you. As you experience God's grace, instead of fighting against it, maybe you should ask, okay, God, what is it that you want to do in my life because of this grace that you've bestowed upon me? As you experience God's grace, may you also remember that his grace does not come haphazardly, but his grace comes into your life to continue to move you in the direction that he wants you to go. God's grace comes into your life to help move you to experience and be who it is that he's created you to be. It's been said that our worst days are never so bad that we are beyond the reach of God's grace. And our good days are never so good that we are beyond the need of God's grace. The Apostle Paul exhorted Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. As you experience God's grace in your life, as you identify God's grace day by day, may you find strength in it. May it be a source of encouragement. May it be a source of hope. Let us pray. Lord, I pray for each one in this sanctuary that you would give us eyes to see your grace in this coming week. Give us eyes to to see your grace at at work in our lives. And and Lord, when we experience your grace, may we not despise it. May we not try and excuse it away. But rather, may we embrace that grace. May we embrace that gift in order that we might become, in order that we might be the person and the people that you have created us to be. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.